As an adoptee, an internal question may surface. Is my identity who I feel I am inside, or how the world may perceive me? This internal struggle of bridging the gap between who you think you are versus what others think you should be can manifest in different ways, especially for transracial adoptees. For anyone, gaining a confident sense of self-identity can take many years, even after reaching adulthood. Sometimes it may be difficult to feel whole, to feel a complete sense of oneself when there are gaps in one's history, when there is a loss of a loved one not through death but through adoption, and when trauma is experienced. If one is laboring to fully accept and embrace who they are, to reconcile the differences between the internal and external, are they able to build a strong sense of self-worth, a sense of belongingness? Join the voices from Appalachia as they talk about identity in the foster care and adoption world and go beyond biological. The capacity to love ourselves develops as we feel loved. And so developmentally, as newborns, as toddlers, as our caretakers love us and fall in love with us, we fall in love with ourselves. And as we love ourselves, as we are loved by others, we grow up with a normative experience of being loved. And then we expect that we'll be loved. But when we don't feel loved, when we don't feel seen or heard, or noticed or cared about. There's no way for us to learn to love ourselves. I spent a long time trying to find attention and find approval with men no matter where I went. And uh, when I finally enlisted in the Army, I would say that probably was one of the best decisions I ever made just because it gave me that structure and those boundaries and those consistencies that I needed. Um, and then when I met Dave, he was patient. And I think that that was the first time that I really realized like somebody can tell the difference between who I am and my behaviors. And that was really helpful. I think every child coming into the foster care or adoption system has some level of struggling with value and worth and especially around family and love. Am I worthy of family? Am I worthy of love? I think for, you know, for a while when I was younger, when I was still uh, sifting through the ideas, I always knew that my parents loved me. But I think particularly because of the comments that um, some less tactful uh, grade school children would say, I think I started to feel a bit, a little, I guess like I was left, so to speak, and of course I knew that that wasn't the case, but it was a feeling that I couldn't really help. But um, obviously I knew that it wasn't true, and I always had my parents to reassure me that it, you know, that they were there and that they wouldn't leave. But um, I think, yeah, that's been a part that's been a bit sour. I think it was certainly more sour when I was younger and it's gotten better over the years. There were definitely times when I can remember thinking, I wish that I was their biological mother. Not so much for me, but maybe for them, that they never had to feel like they weren't loved or they weren't um, okay. Because I think part of an adoptee's Emotions is sometimes feeling like, why did my birth parent not want me? And I didn't want my children to ever have to feel that kind of rejection or pain. In our Western view of the healing of trauma, we would start to really unfold that story and unpack that story about why. Why don't you feel love? What happened to you? Let's talk about it again. Why you don't feel worthy of love? It wasn't introduced to you. You didn't get that at the time that other children did. Let me introduce that to you. 
Because if I can introduce that to you now, instead of asking for you to repeat your story of not being loved, then I can strengthen the potential for love instead of strengthening the story of why you don't deserve love. We'll be together 10 years in about a month and pretty much I've spent 10 years pushing him away and uh, going through different ways of pushing him away, so. So in case to push me away, I. First, I'd, I'd just leave. I'd go places, you know, go see friends, you know, whatever I had to do just get away from the situation because you know, if you don't want me there, I'm not gonna be there, which was easy to do. The more and more it happened, I'd, I knew she loved me and I loved her and me leaving wasn't always the best idea. So I'd, I would just sit there, even if she just went to her room and told me to leave, I would just sit in the living room and watch TV, play video games, you know, whatever, just kept me in the house. And I think that helped a lot for her to know that I was still gonna be there, even though I wasn't being with her at the time. It's gotten a lot better over time, but that's the thing with um, the kind of abuse that I experienced. It's not knowing whether people are gonna be there is not something that I necessarily trust. I think that I keep a few really close friends for the reason that I do feel a bit more safe. But I think that's also a double-edged sword, as in the closer that the friend gets, the more worried I am that they'll disappear. I've always been a bit worried about people disappearing from my life, friends, family, you know. My parents aren't exactly the youngest parents in the world, and so I've always felt the pressure that they will not be here for the amount of time that they have had their parents here. I'd say that I probably think about that subject a fair amount. Um, definitely a lot in seventh grade. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm tearing up suddenly. I think that um, certainly in seventh and eighth grade, I was going through a bit of a rough patch, and that's when this stuff really started to surface. And I mean, it, was, it had always been there, but when I started to get a bit introspective about it, and um, certainly it's always a pressing matter. Um, my dad plays clarinet concerts. And I remember sometimes I used to, or sometimes I still get afraid that in the middle of the concert he might like keel over and die, which is a terrible thought and certainly not one rooted in truth or reality at all. You know, in most instances he will be absolutely 100% fine, but there's always been that fear that like maybe someone will never come home from a road trip or something like that, or my friends Oh, like, you know, get tired of me, just stuff like that that have always been sort of circulating in my consciousness. I was in 10th grade when my mom passed away. Well, I tried to go to counseling for a little bit there. I went once. Um, it wasn't really my thing. They just tried to load me down with medication. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a lot of stimulants they tried to put me on. And I've never really responded well to those anyways. I get really hyper and all that, so. Um, yeah, I went to counseling once over it. Um, I've kind of put up, I guess those are walls that I've put up with that. Um, I never really talk about it with, like in personal relationships, I think I've only talked about it in one. Um, it's just not something I ever really go into with people a lot. And I don't know, the way I tried to deal with it is I tried to ignore it that it happened. So right when it happened, you know, I was going out with friends and all that trying to not think about it because I've always kind of been like that. like. I always have to get out and do something so I'm not sitting at home thinking about it, regardless of what it is. If I'm sitting there, I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to make myself feel worse. So I've always got to get out and do something. So that was kind of my method of kind of handling it. And I think I still kind of do that in the sense that I'm always trying to go out, try to not stay at home um, so I don't get along with my thoughts, I guess. So. There's no really one reason why I like hiking. I think it's just something that we used to do a lot when I was smaller, and we'd certainly go on a lot of hikes with friends. So that's just sort of something I guess I've always done. It's nice, and it's really nice to get out in this weather, obviously. Um, when you were little, I took a year off work, and I we hiked every day, and it felt like that was a way to get you um, in your sensory body. You know, your sensory system was 
um, challenged. And it just felt like put you in your in the little backpack. <laughs> and something about just the slow pace of hiking was really calming to both of us. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll never forget one day I was hiking on this trail and a land turtle about this big crossed the trail and I had you in a backpack that day. And um, I remember thinking how odd it was to see a land turtle this high. And I thought it was a symbol to take everything very slowly. You would think that, and, wouldn't you? And I just loved it. Now, I just have just always felt like somehow the natural world just helped us to be more who we are. That was really cheesy. That was really cheesy. <laughs> you can Mom, just that was a cheese fest. <laughs> that was like what a cheese, cheese fest. Cinnamon cheese fest. <laughs> we didn't need that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'd say that I am probably a bit more introverted than a lot of people. I need a lot of time um, alone to myself, even without necessarily friends texting, I turn my phone off. And I think I used to be a lot more quiet than I am now. I still am, I guess you could say quiet. I don't really like that word because it insinuates for a lot of people, I guess, sort of a weakness that, you know, quiet usually is followed by shy and timid. And I think I've shed a lot of those traits because I did used to be a little bit more of a doormat than I am now. And I think I would hope that I am a bit more assertive now and a bit more outspoken. But I'm also aware that those, you know, that being quiet, I guess, if I'm going to use that word, isn't necessarily a bad thing. But I have struggled with the fact that it might be sort of a negative trait simply because sometimes I'm not heard. I don't know if my voice is just naturally quiet or if I'm just a quiet person, but I'd like to think that I've gained a bit more presence um, since, I guess, sixth grade or middle school. Some people aren't used to a soft voice. Some people really I think it's weak. I wasn't aware I had a soft a, voice. Maybe everybody else just has a loud voice. I don't know. That's the way I've always thought of it. Oh, well, you're my mother. <laughs> I think there is some stereotyping about a softer way of being in the world. And people expect you to be out there and big and strong and extroverted. And I think there's strength in being quiet. And, well, I, be and I do believe that. And some people are not comfortable that. with that. I always feel sad when my friends get into a fight because I've always been like the peacekeeper of the group and trying to keep things together. So I hate it when um, when people get divided or fights break out because I, I try and keep um, everyone happy and um, together. So yeah, that there's been some moments when um, I've been sad because my friends are fighting or leaving people out or stuff like that. I feel like I want to be the peacekeeper because it's my dream for everyone to get along and I feel like I have the most fun when everyone's together and um, happy and nobody's voice is feeling unheard. Occasionally I feel pressure but I don't let it get to me because it's something that needs to be done so everyone can benefit from it and I, I love being the peacekeeper because I love being able to um, have a good relationship with everyone and I love being the person that you can count on to go to if you have a problem or if you need to talk to someone. I'm usually able to help people with their problems at school. I have all kinds of friends and they have all kinds of problems and I've been to so many therapists I feel like I've gotten some of their kind of I can kind of do the same thing they can do. <laughs> pretty much can help them solve a lot of their problems for their home problems and relationship problems. It makes me feel good that I can do that, but at the same time, um, sometimes it'll stress me out. If it's, if it's really often, it's, it's too much. <laughs>
I'm not exactly adverse to confrontation, I'll say that. I mean, it's not like I go around trying to pick arguments with people, but if there's something that needs to be said, I'd be willing to say it. I think I'm pretty clear when something happens. I remember one of my friends, uh, who's a really good friend now, but we were just starting to get friends, and he said uh, something that wasn't very nice. And I said something along the lines of, hey, that's kind of a mean word. Could you maybe not use it anymore? I know that right now the high school's a bit lax about it, but I would rather you not. And so he stopped. And so yeah, I think that I'd like to say that if there's something that makes me like uncomfortable, if I don't agree with something, I guess something probably political, <laughs> I'm more inclined to speak up. The way I deal with confrontation is I just go for it. Um, if there's something bothering me or if there's an elephant in the room, I just, I go for it. I don't like beat around the bush. I get straight to the point because I personally don't like when there's like tension or anything like that. I like when things are just like chill and relax. So whenever there's confrontation or if there's tension, I just go straight for it and get it resolved. I used to avoid confrontation. Um, uh, the last year I have taken it head on. I'll confront someone about anything. <laughs> um, but I've never really been one to try to pick fights unless I have a good reason to. I think uh, it's the fact that I never really wanted to make anybody mad. Uh, I don't like doing that. I don't like make, upsetting anyone. I don't like making anybody mad. or I don't like hurting their feelings. Um, you know, I've never really been an instigator, I guess you could say. But most of my life, I, I avoided confrontation. I'm a pretty competitive person, so I guess you could call that seeking approval. Um, I've always liked to do good in school and have good grades and having friendly competition like in um, soccer and sports and I always strive to be the best I can be. I really appreciate the praise that I get from my friends because they're always really supportive and saying nice things to me and they uplift me even when I don't meet my own standards, they're there. <laughs> and um, my parents have always been um, so helpful to me and encouraging. Like when I wanted to do club soccer instead of just rec soccer, they, they told me to go for it because that was my dream. And um, they are always been so proud of me and proud of my good grades. and the things I do and it's always made me feel um, so much better and helped me want to do it more. When I feel most let down by myself, I think I can get into spirals of sort of, I guess, needy thoughts where I think that I'm not doing enough for my friends and they're going to leave, which I suppose could go back to some other problems I have. I think that that has been something I've been trying to be aware of. I don't want to attach uh, the idea of fulfillment or happiness to praise, and I think that's a bit of a dangerous slope, always needing affirmation. And I've been, you know, as I've gotten into high school, been trying to be more confident in myself without anyone's approval. But I think when I was younger, definitely praise was a big part of my experience. Everyone enjoys like be set, being told that they do a good job but I get too like embarrassed by it or I feel like they're thinking too highly of me sometimes and also like when someone's praised me about something I do I go and do the opposite sometimes because I don't like being looked at like I'm always going to do that thing for them. So I do the opposite sometimes. And I've realized that I think it is um, too much pressure. When I was a kid, I didn't really know what self esteem was, so I guess I didn't have any. Um, I can't. I kind of like pictured myself as like just a blob, just like going through life. But um, since Dave and Joel have given me like a life, like an actual childhood, an actual education, everything I need to like develop and grow as a human being, I feel like I have a lot of self-confidence. I know who I am. Um, 
There are times where it's shaky, where like I feel like I could have more self-esteem. I feel a little down about myself, um, mostly because of my hair. Um, I know I knew that from a young age that I was going to lose all my hair. Um, so actually, like two or three days ago, I just decided to just get it all cut off. Because uh, I was like, if I'm going to go bald, I'm going to go bald on my own terms, and I'm going to look great doing it. So I guess I've, um, I've grown a lot in my self-esteem, and I have Dave and Joel to thank for it. I think my self-esteem is pretty good. Um, I know there's definitely parts of myself that I need to work on, but um, we'll always get there when we get there, and I, I like who I am, and uh, I can't wait to see what I will be in like a few years. There are moments where I see the most incredibly confident young woman coming into this world. And then there are moments when that confidence just wants to fly out the window. She's very much her own person. I admire that about her. Doesn't mean she's immune to other adolescent things that happen to many 16-year-olds in terms of fitting in and all of that. but. Yeah, an interesting person who I think can hang on to her uniqueness. And it's like when she was growing up, you know, there would be forward, 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 scooch back. Um, so yeah, it's fluid. I would not say, oh, she's a confident young woman ready to go into the world, but at the same time, I really trust that that's coming. I would say that in some aspects I am confident and in some aspects I am not. I have always had a bit of a thing with people older than me. I always used to, um, well, I guess I still do, I put them up on a pedestal. I think I fear more being judged, you know? And I think I would like to think that I don't conform simply for the idea of conforming, but I do think that I guess certain people's opinions matter a little more and I tend to get a bit worried when their opinions might not be the most positive of me. There are moments when Malin doesn't have the confidence uh, in her abilities and in herself um, but I think for a 16 year old Perhaps that's not all that unusual. I really trust that um, she'll continue to um, be her own self and will continue to allow that to happen.